People give all manner of reasons for going to sea, and there's a different reason for every man who makes a long voyage. Val Howells likens his yacht to a psychiatrist's couch. Che Blythe is interested in finding out how he'll react under extremes of stress. The American journalist Robert Manry, on the other hand, crossed the Atlantic in a 12-footer and then explained disarmingly that it was something he'd always wanted to do and his boat seemed big enough. Anyway, he couldn't really afford anything bigger, so why not? Robin Knox Johnston, first man to girdle the globe non-stop and alone, says that he set out a boy and came back a man, that is, after proving his manhood pretty thoroughly in the air. Watch children make their first trip to the seaside. They dash towards the water in sheer delight. They're held spellbound by it, and many, many of them remain that way for the rest of their lives. And since much of a sea's attraction is its naturalness, it surely makes good sense to travel over it in the most natural way possible, driven by the unseen power of the wind. A sailing boat is clean, silent, sympathetic, and it'll never run out of fuel. Of all man's inventions, it's probably the closest to nature, the most natural. So isn't it natural, too, that more and more should want to get into them? Mr Blythe, what are you hoping to do in this boat? Well, the aim of uh, the exercise is to try and circumnavigate the world non-stop but from east to west. Can I ask you, do you feel scared at this moment? Oh yes, goodness me, yes. I feel very apprehensive about it. I'll settle down once I get to sea, but uh, you're always apprehensive about any trip like this. Times were hard and the wages low. Leave it, Johnny, leave her. It's time for us to roll and go. It's time for us to leave her. I thought I heard the old man say, Leave it, Johnny, leave her. Just one more pull and then be late. It's time for us to leave her. Do you have to go by this method? Yes, I must go by this method because uh, I want the boat out there to live in. But at your age, aren't you taking a dreadful risk? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think it's any more of a risk than motoring, say, from Inverness Shire to Sussex. In fact, you took a risk motoring down here on these congested roads. Well, Mr Campbell, you're in charge of the boat. Don't you think at your respective ages it's just a bit foolhardy? No, I don't think so at all, because your mental faculties are just as sharp at my age as they are in a young man of 30. But you're not so agile. No, certainly you're not so agile, but in my time at sea I've learned to do things the easy way and we always do that. But if you should be hit by a violent storm, will you be able to cope as well as a younger man? Oh, certainly. Perhaps better than a younger man because I understand storms better than younger men do. I've been in plenty of them and I know how to avoid them. But have you been in them in a boat of this size? Yes, I have not actually been in them. I have run away from them in a boat this size. Well, gentlemen, please don't get me wrong, but, you know, there is an old saying that there's no fool like an old fool. Don't you think a lot of people will, will say, well, you're just a couple of old fools? Oh, I don't think so. We've heard about uh, old heads and young shoulders. This is uh, probably an old head and old shoulders, and uh, I think we'll manage all right. South Caroline is a sultry climb where we used to work in the summertime. Mass underneath the shade would lay while we poor slaves must toil all day. So early in the morning, so early in the morning, so early in the morning before the break of day. When I was young I used to wait on Mass's table, lay the plate. Pass him bottles when him dry, brush away the blue tail fly. So early in the morning, so early in the morning, so early in the morning before the break of day. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Manry. Thank you very much. How do you feel now? Oh, I just feel fit as a fiddle. I'm more rested than when I started, really. I just hope I make the next uh, six miles or whatever it is. <laughs> Have you been surprised by this reception? 
Yes, very much so. I I thought I was just going to slip in quietly to Falmouth and tie up somewhere and go to a hotel and get the sleeper. I didn't expect anything like this. And uh, why have you made this trip? Well, I suppose I'd have to lie on a psychoanalyst's couch to really answer that question, but uh, I, I've uh, read all the sailing books, you know, about, about other voyages, many of them Englishmen, Edward Alcard and uh, oh, Peter uh, Hamilton and uh, Patrick Allam and Colin Moody, who went across in San Fernando, and I've drawn my inspiration for this trip from them, I guess. How have you slept in here? Hardly any room. Well, I, I uh, sleep mainly sort of in a semi-sitting-up position. Uh, uh, and partly reclined. And it, it seems fairly comfortable. And every night I'm so tired, I just drop right off to sleep anyway. So, Aren't you frightened of something happening, being mown down? Well, I, I leave an anchor light out all night so that uh, at least that gives me a little sense of security. Whether it gives me real security or not is another story, I guess. Ah, uh, that's... Well, and you're off sea lanes, there's not much chance of that, and so I just figured... That... What, what are your impressions of the Atlantic now? Well, uh, actually, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I expected to be capsized at least once, and uh, I wasn't at all, although I was knocked overboard six times by waves breaking over the boat. You got back all right? You got back all right. Weren't you frightened? No, not really, because I knew I wouldn't be knocked so far away that I couldn't get back on the boat, and I had part, part of those times I was tied to the boat, so I couldn't possibly have been separated from it. Have you been frightened at all? Well, I may have, I've been nervous, let's say that. I, I haven't been frightened or terrified. Uh, one time I got nervous is when my uh, rudder broke. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Must be half of Falmouth right there. Yes. <laughs> they got a great reception for you waiting in Falmouth. Oh my goodness. Would you do this trip again? Well, I. I'd... Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming to see me. <laughs> I'd like to do it again, but in a larger boat and, and with somebody, with my family maybe. I don't think I'd want to do it again uh, just this way. I mean, once is enough. Why do it again? What do you long for now? Well, uh, my real ambition has been to sail around the world in a small boat. And if I ever get a chance to do that with my family, I, I'd like to do it. You'd like to take your family this time? Uh, yes. Uh, that's a mighty lonely place out there in the Atlantic without anybody. It was a cold and dreary morning in December. December. And all of me money it was spent. Spent, spent. Where it went to, Lord, I can't remember. Remember. So down to the shipping office I went. Went, went. went. Paddy lay back. Paddy lay back. Take in your slack. Take in your slack. Take a turn around the capstan, Eva Paul. Eva Paul. All about ship station, boys, be handy, be handy. We're bound for Valparaiso around the horn. Well, some of the fellas had been drinking, drinking, and I myself was heavy on the booze, booze, booze. And I sat on me old sea chest a thinking, a thinking. I turn into me bunk and have a snooze, snooze, snooze. Paddy lay back, Paddy lay back. Take in your slack, take in your slack. Take a turn around the capstan, Eva Paul. Eva Paul. About ship station, boys, be handy, be handy. We're bound for Valparaiso around the horn. You may not believe it, but I'm usually relieved to leave the land behind. A boat's not something meant to swing around and mooring in a muddy creek. A boat's meant to take you away from the land. But why so far from the land? Why across 3,000 miles of ocean? And why alone? Well, isn't there a bit of the maverick, the rogue animal in all of us? What's the point of running with the herd all the time? Conforming, consenting, keeping in the fashion, keeping in the groove. Must we all be the same? If you spend your life trying to keep up with the Joneses, all you learn in the end is that the Joneses are very boring people. And you've got to come to look like them. And then it's too late to change. Not for me, thanks. I think you've got to work at being yourself, at getting to know yourself, warts and all. Slow the thing down. Forget the rat race. Stand back from yourself. You see yourself in a strange, at least an unfamiliar perspective. 
For a long time, the sea and how your boat behaves at sea, these things occupy you entirely. To sail her well is enough to employ you by day and night. And that means your body and your mind, the two are one. You begin to get an inkling of what went into the making of the old myths, the journeying, the voyaging, the impossible tasks, the hero pitting himself against impossible odds. And not unexpectedly, you don't feel in the same league, but now you're stuck with it. You might have bitten off more than you can chew. But when you've tended your boat every yard of the way, when you've done a thousand miles in her, when every creak and shudder is familiar, when you know every angle she can show you to the sea and sky, you begin to husband the wind as though by second nature. If the wind changes its key by so much as a semitone, it brings you from below to change your sail. You don't have to think about it. You can settle now to the rhythm of the ocean. As the days go by, you begin to have time to look into yourself. And it's possible that you won't altogether like what you see. There are the old vanities. Nobody observes you, it's true, but you keep up appearances. And if you don't at once scrutinize too closely what you're like and what you've done with your life, you're on the way to it. Surrounded by sea and nothing but sea, and on an unbelievably easy passage like this with nothing that varies to focus on but yourself, you weigh up this and that. You begin to miss the world. And partly from boredom, and partly from a real, if mild, sense of deprivation, that second nature you've acquired takes on a voice of its own. One day you hear yourself saying, what am I missing? What had been nice? But when the breaking point seems near, practicalities, the endless waters coming to an end, begin to pull me back. The printer's ink, marks on the chart, start to stick up out of the sea. The fastened rock. So whatever else has happened since I turned my back, to haven't moved Ireland. The world begins to remind me it has other inhabitants, so I prepare for them. I've begun to come back into the realm of what is attainable. Whatever hunger it is that drives a man away alone, there's a limit to it. There's a limit to lying on your 12-ton floating psychiatrist's couch. The truth is, the crossing of an ocean alone in a small boat doesn't leave you with a feeling of achievement that'll allow you to sit back and muse about it endlessly until your beard is altogether white. The sea is all persuasion and promises. It'll tease you back and promise you peace again, or what passes for peace. It creates as many desires as it satisfies, and it leaves you less uppity. Maverick or not, conformer or non-conformer, the only place to be is with other people, even in their way, if you press me, the Joneses. 3,000 miles alone. It's a long way to go to prove such a simple truth. Too far to go? I think perhaps that all I'm saying finally is that I believe every man can be his own artist. I don't really think you need to have a brush to be an artist. By an artist, I mean a man with a freshness of eye, living on distances, though they are close about him, living, if you like, on the horizon of himself. I say, old man, your horse is dead. And we say so, and we hope so. I say, old man, your horse is dead. Poor old man. After hard work and sore abuse. And we say so, and we hope so. We'll sort him down for sailor use. Poor old man. Hold up to the yard, or me must be. And, and we say so, and, and we hope so. And drop him down to the depths of the sea. Poor old man. What's the difference between sail and steam? Well, my comparison is this. Sail is a lady. Steam is a bundle of iron. Well, a man must be mad or one money bad to venture catching whales. For he may be drowned when the fish turns around, or his head be smashed by his tail. Though the work seems grand to the young green hand, and his heart is high when he goes. In a very short burst, he'd as soon hear a curse 
as the cry of the sheep blows. Well, these trials we bear for nigh for ye, till the flying jib points for home. We're supposed for our tour to get a bonus on the oil and an equal share of the bone. But we go to the agent to settle for the trip, and we find we've cause to repent. For we slaved away four years of our life, and earned about three pounds and... Why do you like brown boats better than other boats? Uh, oh, they, because they're much easier to handle. You can keep a brown boat going in any sort of wind, so long as you've got the right sail, and you can turn them on a sixpence, you can handle them in more wind than the other boats can go in, and the other ones are broad in the beam, and you have to stretch out your leg, and sometimes your leg slips, and then the whole thing goes haywire. Oh, oh, a brown boat every time. There's something absolutely different about brown boats that nobody's ever built a boat like them yet, and they're, they're wonderful things. Some people would wonder how you can still sail and race at over 70. Well, I think you, you learn a lot of tricks, you know. You, you, get, you don't get older without getting a bit wiser. And uh, you remember things that you did 30 years ago that perhaps people haven't heard of. And also, from my point of view, of course, I've got a wonderful crew. And it, um, they, they handle the main sheet generally for me, as well as the jib. It makes all the difference. Be a... What are some of the tricks you've learned in the 30 years that help you now? I think the timing of the start is a sort of... You get it built into your system somewhere. You know how long it's going to get. You see, you've got to start in a particular place at a split second, or you're over the line and then you've had it. You've got to go back. Anything can happen. Uh, starts definitely are a tremendous thing that only come with a, a lot of practice. But um, oh, I remember old Mr. Clavin at 80 doing a superb port tack start. We all thought it was a starboard start. We started one end of the line and at over 80, he started on the point, got clear away from us. Marvellous bit. I hope I'll be able to do that when I'm over 80. Oh, my name is William Kidd. As I sail, as I sail. Oh, my name is William Kidd. As I sail. Oh, my name is William Kidd. And God's laws I did forbid. And most wickedly I did. As I sail, as I sail. To the execution dock. I must go, I must go. To the execution dock. I must go to the execution dock while many thousands flock, but I must bear the shock. I must die, I must die. Now a warning take by me. I must die, I must die. Oh, a warning take by me. I must die. Oh, a warning take by me and shun bad company, lest you come to hell with me. I must die, I must die. Arthur, you've been sailing for, what, 60 years, I suppose? Yes. And when you started, it was really just a rich man's hobby, wasn't it? Yes, and the skipper of the boat was a professional seaman. He was paid. It was like driving a train. Now you've got a engine driver up the front and another man shoveling coal, who you did have. And now it's just as though all the passengers are driving the train. It's really mass production that's um, changed everything, is not it? Yes, it's a terrible thing. In the old days, everyone wanted a boat different and his own boat and so that everybody knew his, it was his boat without any devices. But now all the boats are the same, and they're all producing this fibreglass, and it's rather like an artificial insemination. <laughs> a lot more uh, for less effort. As a designer, has it affected you? Well, in the old days, you had to keep designing new boats to earn money, 
but now you design one and this is reproduced in glass fibre or fiberglass and they go on and on and you get royalties off each boat so you have the same amount of money and less work. As far as the actual sailing is concerned, what would you say the great challenges are that still exist? I don't believe the chaps have sailed around the world as far back as 1898. And uh, I think all of that's been done. We've got Sir Francis Chichester trying to do 200 miles a day. Yes, well, we did that in 1920, gone across the Atlantic. Really? But there were four of us in the boat, not just one. With a good wind. Yeah, but he's got a great long boat, you see, and he's going to be in the trades. But nothing uh, difficult in that. What about Che Blythe going round the wrong way and in a steel boat? Are well, we going to see more steel boats, do you think? Oh, yes, the, the Dutch have always built of steel because they've got no trees there. They've always had steel boats and we're running short of timber and uh, also we're losing boat builders. So there'll be more steel boats in the future, just as there will be more glass fibre boats. Of course, in your time, you sailed with many famous people, not least Prince Philip. Who stands out in your memory? Well, Prince Philip stands out as a wonderful seaman, and very few people can gauge the tide as he does. When you're sailing across the tide with a free wind, you've got to get on a steady course for the next mark. And you don't steer at the next mark, you steer to port or starboard of it. Prince Philip, steady as a rock. And he's the best seaman I know, uh, and the best chap to do that sort of thing. Alpha, nowadays, of course, you don't go sailing yourself, but you watch the sailing from the balcony of this extraordinary house right on the edge of the water at Cowes. What do you think as you watch the people sailing out there? Is the sport as good as it used to be? Oh, yes, it's uh, much better because... You've got all sorts of chaps taking part in it. And in the old days, you knew when you went down to the sail west, you only had to beat a certain man to be the winner of the races. But now there's so many at it and so many new chaps, you don't know who you've got to beat until you get there. And then you start to sort things out. All on the ball and homeward we are going. All on the ball in the ball in hop on the ball in before she starts a rolling. All on the ball in the ball in hop on the ball in the skipper is a growling. All on the ball in the ball in hop on the ball in so early in the morning. All on the ball in the ball in hop on the ball in tis Bristol we are going. All on the ball in the ball in hop on the ball in Kitty is me darling. All on the ball in the ball in hop. <coughs> Did you get it? <coughs> I feel him just a bit. <coughs> and it really is rather uncomfortable down below here. There's water all over the place. But it <coughs> well there it's a little live now. In fact, rather <coughs> yeah, even as I spoke, that was a long we dashed on into a long one then, with dire results. <coughs> and this is only about three hours after the start. Off the needles. Coming towards the evening of the first day. Well, maybe we'll be getting it all over in the early stages. We'll see. We stand for anchor, we carry on our bow. We stand for bowsprit to bowl out along. C for the capstan which we heave around, and D for our duty to which we are bound. Merrily, cheerily, so merrily are we, no mortal on earth like a sailor at sea. Heave away, all away, I do a down, give a sailor his grog. Sea shanties and sailors' rhymes are very pretty and nostalgic, 
they're a long, long way from present-day actuality. Some of our sharpest modern sailors wouldn't know a sea shanty from a nursery rhyme, and they're not in the least ashamed about it either. And most of them have never made a trans-ocean voyage. They simply haven't the time. They have to cram all their sailing into weekends and summer holidays, and this is why so many of them race. And because of the rising cost of everything, they race in quite small boats. Only a very small fraction of those who drive cars ever race cars. But sooner or later, I suppose that four out of five of those who sail boats end up by racing them. It's the quickest way of smartening up your seamanship and learning the finer points, and it gives extra purpose to a day's sailing. The trio you are about to hear are from the modern sailing generation. Each has raced and won times without number. John Oakley, crewed by David Hunt, won the world championship of one of the world's hottest small boat classes, the Flying Dutchman. Owen Parker, who comes from a long line of South Coast professionals, is himself an amateur. He races because neither his wife nor anybody else can keep him away from the water. He's crewed round the island winners and Cowsweek winners and famous yachts time and again and he's looking forward to another win or two next weekend. If you think sailing is simple, just listen to these men. They know it's a matter of the little things, the little grains of sand that all add up, as a famous America's Cup skipper once said, trying to explain why he nearly always won. John Oakley, uh, you are ex-world flying Dutchman champion, you're the current national sailing champion, you've won more national dinghy championships than anybody, I think. Can you sum up in a few well-chosen words uh, the secret of success as a racing helmsman? Yeah, it's difficult, but I would put it down to preparation, mainly. Preparing oneself for the race, finding out all there is to know about local knowledge, preparing the boat, making sure all the fittings are correctly positioned, the right things, going through a few sails to make sure you get the best, and tuning the boat to suit the riding moment you have available. And that can mean that uh, you have a greater riding moment with a very tall light crew than you would with a small light crew. But there's no reason at all why the boat shouldn't go to windward at exactly the same speed, as long as you can tune it to stay upright the same mm. amount. When you talk of riding moment, <laughs> you mean the ability to withstand the healing effect of the wind, right? Correct. To give the boat power. Correct. Well, now you're racing keel boats and not dinghies. Do you find there's a great difference between the two and the techniques you need? Yes, there is, especially in starting. Starting, I find great difficulty. In dinghies, when you start, you can accelerate and, and slow down as you approach the starting line so that you can regulate your speed on your approach. With a keel boat, you cannot do this. You have to hit the line going flat out. And uh, it's very difficult to actually time the boat mm. over the last 50 feet. Yes, and of course if you don't have such a good start with a keel boat, you haven't got the nippiness of a dinghy to pull yourself out of trouble. As Correct, a and all the back markers who approach the line, or they've made a bad start but they approach the line very fast, surge past you and you end up by being last. Have you any particular highlights in your racing life to look back on? How about winning the World Championship in the Dutchman at Montreal? Does that stick out in your memory? I think so. Yes, I, it was an unusual world championship insofar that the first two days there was some wind and the rest of the week there wasn't any. And on the last day we had two races and in the morning we were lying second on points and after the second race of that day we then held a points lead. But we were out there on the water with hardly any wind in the hot sun for 14 hours and we finished just as the sun was dropping down below the horizon. I think that we managed to keep our senses better than the other people, mainly because we had sufficient food and water, which everybody else appeared to run out of. So at the end, we were still quite fresh, while the other ones were dead beat. I suppose it must have had something to do with your crew, David Hunt, because uh, you must have been able to... Re you talk about retaining a sense of proportion and whatnot. Um, the crew is very important, and I'd like to introduce David Hunt at this stage, actually. And not only was he John Oakley's crew when they won this famous championship in Montreal, but he's also something of an expert on the rigging and masting of boats, being a structural engineer as well as a sailor. David, can you tell us what you think are the most important things in uh, making one boat faster than another? Well, I feel that a lot of people have concentrated on getting the 
maximum propulsive force from the wind to drive them forward. And I think the majority of sailors understand this quite well. But a little known effect is, I think, the force of the wind that's driving you backwards. There's quite a lot of the boat that is parasitic, that is not creating any forward drive, and any windage on these surfaces is tending to reduce your overall performance. And I would say that in the future, sailing boats will go far better when they pay attention to these forces that are not helping them go forward. And to this end, I would think that we will see boats having flush decks with no obstruction, masts being very aerodynamic, and possibly even the sailors on board um, equipped so that they offer the least drag to the air passing over them. Mm. On the equipment front, the problems of raking a mast going to windward and getting a mast upright downwind is um, intriguing most crews. And to do this, we have to use um, more and more sophisticated equipment and I think that hydraulic jacks, which are just coming into operation for backstays on the large ocean-going craft, will in fact come into their own for shroud adjustments, even on small dinghies, as soon as equipment has been developed that's suitable for controlling these jacks. At the moment, it's quite primitive. But why technically it could why be is it that it's necessary to get the mast aft going to windward and forward downwind, do you think? Well, I think that if you consider a line through the maximum fullness of the mainsail, the optimum position for that line should be vertical and with a single sailed boat such as a fin when it rakes its mast or rather bends its mast a lot going to windward the line through the maximum fullness of the sail is nearly vertical. Um, downwind the rig should be upright to present the maximum obstruction to the air trying to get through. On a conventional dinghy you have to physically rake the mast in order to get the maximum lift line through the sail vertical for windward performance and let the shrouds go downwind in order to get everything at right angles to the airflow. There is a lot of debate over the reasons for this. I prefer to go back to nature and say that the mainsail of a boat is akin to a bird's wing and there are very few birds in nature that have the leading edge of their wing spanning squarely to their bodies. They're all raked aft a little bit and I think this is something mm -hmm. to do with raking the mast to windward. This is all a bit theoretical. What can you say that could be a more practical use to, say, the owner of a mirror dinghy? I think the mirror dinghy is the most popular racing dinghies in the country. What can they do to get more speed out of their boats? Well, I think all of these technical things that we've said presuppose that you've put in years of honest training, honest sailing, and you've come to grips with a problem. In fact, for the mirror dinghies, I think the best advice is to get out there sailing and to race as often as possible and to get as much experience as possible. If you find yourself in a situation where you're then equal to another person and there is little that you can do to make yourself go faster through pure sailing, then there's not the least reason why you shouldn't apply sophisticated techniques of the larger boats to the mirror dinghy to try and rake the mast going to windward and bring it upright downwind. Well, that touches on the question of practice, yes, and I'm sure the average British sailor doesn't practice nearly enough. One who practices far more than others is Owen Parker, who comes from a sort of different background to either Oakley or Hunt, because um, he really comes from a, a, the classic keelboat background. I think Owen must be the most famous yacht crew on the Solent. He must have won, shared in victories in more yachts than almost anybody racing in the Solent, and currently he's crewing for the, the Prime Minister on his new morning cloud. I think the interesting thing about this is that as soon as they launched it, they went in for about, well, he tells me, eight days of um, practicing and tuning. You really think, Owen, that this made the difference in, I mean, after all, after this tuning, you went in your second race, you won, didn't you? So it must have made some difference. <clears throat> yes, we did. We, um, we launched the boat on the Saturday and went sailing that afternoon. The idea was to get the boat settled down as soon as possible, so, um, well, the crew and the boat, a, to get any jobs um, put right that were wrong on the boat, any winches repositioned to suit the crew. This was very important, and as we had eight clear days at Easter, we thought that we couldn't start none too soon. Yes, one of the things I noticed was that uh, this first ocean race of the season, this Seine Bay race, took most people by surprise. I mean, at Gosport, just before the start, everybody was running around looking for 
petrol or one thing or another. People were finishing making spas and that sort of thing. But aboard Morning Cloud, you all seemed completely ready. In fact, you were sitting in the cockpit discussing a race, I think. Yes, we were. They, um, the skipper um, wanted the boat at Gosport at four where he was joining it. And um, we got aboard and all changed and the boat was ready because we got the boat ready coming round from the handball with uh, three of the crew joined me at handball. And we got the boat ready, and so when the skipper came aboard, um, we got changed, and the boat was ready. We sat down and had coffee or tea, and discussed the whole, the preparations for the race, and the crew was in the right mind. And I agree with you, Jack, that um, at the marina at Gosport on the Friday, everyone seemed to be walking around getting spare mm. parts and finding their crew, and some crew were walking around looking for their boats, but we were. I think we were about the best organised boat there at the time. Yeah. We went out to the start in good time, which is very important to uh, get the start line, I think, at least three quarters an hour to half hour to three quarters before the actual gun to see what the wind and tide and things like that doing, get the crew settled down. And Well, if we can, you know, just make good starts like that, I think it's worth this some extra time. Well, this victory you had was in an ocean race. Uh, up till a few years ago, you were better known for Solent racing. Which sort of racing do you prefer and why? Well, I was brought up in six metres and international one designs. And at the time, I wouldn't have given second thought to what ocean racing because I thought that, uh, that it was just cruising in company. But after I'd done two or three ocean races, I began to like it because then I knew that there were a crew as keen on winning races offshore as I was in the Solent, which made everything worthwhile to me. And since then I've grown to like the shorter ocean races more and more. Until I did the Sydney Hobart, I wasn't too keen on five-day races. But when you win a long race like that, it makes you more keener to, to go in for these things. But now I'm in for the Admiral's Cup racing for the first time in my life, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm surprised to hear it's the first time in your life. You've been in the One Ton Cup, haven't I've, you? Yes, I have, with, with, with some made in the Havre, which wasn't a very good series, and that put me off a bit of offshore racing because it took us six days to do about a 250-mile race. Yes. But um, I, I go back to the Sydney Hobart race again. That, um, that race went so well, and the um, Bermuda race last year, which I did on Lou Team, went extremely well. But I think the reason for myself liking offshore races is having a good skipper, a good boat and a very good crew with me. Doesn't it worry you a bit that you're racing on handicap and that the first home might not win? I mean, you've, you've said you've been brought up on level racing and six metres, that sort of thing. Don't you miss that? Yes, I do. I, I miss it tremendously. As I think the best racing in the world for me was six metres. But as there's no six metres now and the IOD class is getting very small, I prefer the big ocean races now because you get used to the handicap racing, especially in Australia when you report your position in twice a day and you hear the position of other boats which your navigator can plot. You can't see the opposition. If your navigator is doing his job properly, you can see on a chart and the positions you lay to them. Yeah. And this is very important. But I, I, I now like, I now enjoy my offshore racing that I've never enjoyed before. Last year was the beginning of me enjoying offshore racing. You've never been troubled with seasickness? No, I've never been troubled with seasickness. I suspect it was because my father and my, my grandfather was all on the J-boats, and I think this is it was in the family, this racing luck. Since you've got the tradition in the family, um, how do you think standards of modern racing compare to those of the past? Well, I think in the, in the, the olden day racing, the, the men were real men, you know, in, in his fact is um, they had to be extremely fit. I think, in fact, they were fitter now. The old professionals were fitter than the modern crews for the simple reason they used to do everything by hand and no, not so many winches. And the help we get from the manufacturers of marine equipment now is absolutely fantastic where it used to take three men to do one job, one man can do it now, but he has got the assistant of a winch or a handy billy or runner blocks yeah. and all sorts of things like this. But I think the crew have got more technical-minded with the new fittings and these new sea stays and address... Uh, you think it's making them soft in a way? Well, not really in a way. I think they're, they, they're getting more technical-minded now to what they ever used to be, mm. but I don't think they are as, as fit as they used to be. 
And yet it's only recently that people have been talking about going into the gymnasium to train for sailing. Well, I think this is to get as fit as they used to be in the olden days. I've got a picture of old-time crews getting into the pub to get training. You know. Ah, this is during the day, Jack, when the, when the professional were day fit in the boat, say, then at Gosport and at Hamble. But, but I, I think now that the modern crew spends more time in the pub then it's good for them, yeah. especially Kay's week and, uh, I shouldn't say this, <laughs> and Burnham week that they spend a lot of the time in the pubs at night. I'd like to bring John and David in on this question of physical fitness. I mean, how important do you think it is to train in the winter, John, to help race, uh, win races in the summer? It's absolutely essential. I think sailing generally at weekends, if you put enough effort into it, keeps you fit through the summer, but in the winter time, you've got to do gym work running or something like that because one might say that fitness helps when it blows hard, but it also helps you when it's very light. In other words, you're relaxed, you're free to think, you're not worried too much about when you're in a cramped position about your muscles aching and that sort of thing. And I honestly believe that a lot more people ought to do this gym work. Do you agree with that, David? Or? Well, I think so. The problem is complicated by the fact that a really good helmsman who is not fit will beat a really bad helmsman who is fit. But on the other hand, what generally happens in racing is that two people get to the same standard of expertise, and under these conditions, when the crunch is really on, the winning person will be the one who's fittest. Uh, one tip that I would give to many sailors, dinghy sailors, is that I don't think they realize how easy it is to be below par during a race due to the fact that you have not prepared yourself correctly from the point of view of food and drink. It was very noticeable, uh, as John mentioned when we were in Montreal, that at the conclusion of 14 hours racing, we both felt very well. And this was largely due to the fact that we had been eating concentrated food during the race and drinking substances such as orange squash. It's very well known that when young children become fractious, they're either tired or hungry. And the same thing goes in sailing. Crews that get really irritated and excitable it's often due to uh, the fact that their body just isn't functioning correctly. And of course this must apply even more offshore. Uh, people have greasy dinners and things before they go off. Yes, I think very often the sailors feed themselves on the very worst food that they can find. Sandwiches, greasy dinners, beer. It isn't likely to be conducive to very fine spinnaker handling or good performances to windward. Mm -hmm. We must, I'm afraid, regard ourselves as machines. And we don't run high compression engines on low compression fuel. And the same applies with our bodies. What surprised me about that win of yours in Montreal, John, was that you did it in very light airs. And up till then, the British certainly haven't been well known for winning light weather <coughs> races. Um, we have more wind than, say, the Swiss lake sailors. Did you fancy your chances before that in light weather? Or? No, not at all. We, we had performed up till then very badly in light weather. But knowing this handicap we had, we had taken precautions of going to the majority of open meetings abroad or international meetings abroad where the wind was definitely lighter than at home and were practiced. And uh, generally speaking, I think that it paid off in the end. We did have the two races when there was some wind at uh, Montreal and typical English weather and we walked it. But the next lot of races that came along which were light, we really had to fight our way through it. But I think our preparation of going abroad to the places that had lighter wind definitely helped us. One of the things that worries me a bit in the development of modern racing is how more and more difficult it is to win races. You've got to give up more time, spend more money on your boats and practice longer because everybody's getting better and the competition's increasing. Isn't this forcing out the weekend sailor? What do you think, Owen? Well, I really do, especially in the class of boat I'm racing in now, the ocean racers, and um, the only thing I recommend is, um, if you like the offshore racing boats, is do what I do. Try to really get as good as you can, and then get aboard one of these ocean racers that, that you've got a, a very good skipper that can afford to um, race these boats, and you go along as one of the crew. But otherwise, um, myself, I'm not in any position to put any money forward to, no. to help to run the boat or anything like that. But I think this is the only way anyone can really do offshore racing if they like it as much as I do. Because the encouraging thing is that uh, there is always a huge demand for good crews. And oh, good. Owners are always crying out for good crews. For really good crews, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Jack. It's absolutely... To get 
28 English boats this year filled with the top crews, it's... It's impossible. It's already, impossible, it? and if yeah. any young chap's coming into the game that really puts his heart and soul to it, he could get on almost any Admiral's Cup boat if he was really good. John Oakley, in a nutshell, give us a tip or two on how to win a yacht race. Well, first basic move, of course, is to be first across the starting line because it's a lot harder for the people to pass you in this way. You can lead. The second, if you happen to be behind at any time, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, always try and pass your opponent if you're on starboard tack to windward and if you're on port tack to leeward because the wind always tries to veer during the day. And thirdly, always go like hell on the last leg, because this is where so many people give up. Owen Parker, you're famous for setting a genoa and a spinnaker together downwind. Why do you do this? Well, I do it mostly on the reach, Jack, because it causes another slot. Um, but the biggest secret, I think, is, is when the wind is forward of the beam, and under 12 knots of wind. The crewman with the spinnaker sheet should always take the sheet in his hands and go to a position on the boat where he can see the luff of the spinnaker and not try to trim it from the cockpit. And what do you think a skipper is looking for in a new crew? He's looking for fitness, common sense and able to get the time off. <laughs> David Hunt, a tip or two from you. I think one of the things is during a race never to give up. If you're lying last, fight to try and be second, second to last. last. Fight, fight to get further up the fleet because there are many championship events where the decision on the ultimate winner has depended upon whether he finished sixth or seventh in a particular race. So the motto must be never give up trying. From the point of view of the boat, I would say pay attention to the underwater finish, particularly of the centreboard and rudder. You cannot put too much time into getting a very smooth and fair surface for these critical parts. From all of this, you should be able to see that if you want to become a famous sailor, it's probably going to be easier to stick a sail on top of a barrel and sail it around the world than win a gold medal in the Yachting Olympics. In yacht racing, there are no short cuts. To beat the next chap, you'll have to think about it a bit harder, practice a little more, prepare yourself and your boat with more care. Luck can and often does affect the outcome of a single yacht race, but over a series or a regatta or a season, the best man always comes out on top. And though sailing boats are as old as the hills, they are also as responsive to modern science as a modern jet airliner, and for many of the very same reasons. The chief fascination of yacht racing is that it engages at all levels. Race tactics are as intellectually demanding as chess. Boat tuning calls for the scientific approach. Hard weather demands physical strength and fortitude. Light weather rewards patience, opportunism, resourcefulness. And perhaps the best thing about it is that you can start sailing and racing as a schoolboy in a small dinghy and think you know it all and still be trying to win races 60 years later, woefully aware of how ignorant about it you really are.